Okay. Everybody knows this map, right? Right? Yeah. All right. This is Chicago. We're what? Down here? This is where we are? <laughs> right. So this is a, uh, um, uh, you know, the Chicago neighborhood maps are, 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 you know, published in, you know, many, many places. And one talks about the stratification. This is a, 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 a map that was published uh, with data that came from, uh, I don't remember exactly what, I, I shouldn't talk about the data source, but the idea is, is that it's a dot map, right? And every dot represents 25 households and the modal um, ethnicity uh, slash race of the household is recorded in covers, in colors. And what's interesting about this map to me is that normally when you look at the Chicago pictures, there are these very sharp boundaries, which were the things that were defined in the 20s. You see these little blocks, right? And here, what you see is that, well, gee, up here, the boundary is kind of porous, right? And down here, the boundaries are a little bit sharper. And, and um, now, um, uh, uh, someone who is connected to the guy who did this map did a similar map, um, actually using income distribution data, and then plotted out people in the same way by income level using the same technique. Um, and I don't have this nap in the slide pack, but what it turns out, it, it's interesting to think about overlaying the two because it turns out that the income stuff is much more gradual, right? It's not, it, Chicago is, is very stratified by, by, by ethnically, but it's much less stratified by income. You can find other cities in the United States that are not stratified ethnically at all. I have a similar picture somewhere else of San Antonio and it's just you know undulating waves of colors you know that go back and forth, uh, and um, and you see these pictures. It makes me want to be a geographer because the computer stuff is cool and the and the artwork is cool, uh, and um, um, and and one of the things that I think we need to think about you know is, is how to do measurement on networks. Um, uh, things like um, 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 I'd like to figure out how to overlay the um, um, uh, the income data on the um, ethnicity data and say something meaningful, right, about the, about the joint distribution and network properties of the joint distribution. But it's not what I want to talk about. All right, um, uh, what I want to talk about is a property called homophily, right? Homophily um, uh, is um, uh, uh, this idea that, uh, um, that if we have, we want to think about having a network where individuals differ um, you know, in their characteristics. And not surprisingly, we find when we study networks like that, that people are connected to people who are like themselves, right? That's not a surprise. That's what homophily is called. Um, there are several sources of homophily. Now, now, what does this homophily do? This homophily causes clustering. If, in fact, I tend to buddy up with people who have similar characteristics, right? Um, similar attributes to me, and then our behavior influences each other, right? Then we get this kind of correlation between attributes and behavior, which is magnified by the fact that we have this peer connection, right? So it's an example of the kind of um, uh, social uh, um, uh, uh, magnifier or multiplier that um, uh, Glazer, Sacerdote, and Schechtman were looking at. Um, uh, in order to kind of unpack that further, it's important to know what are the sources of homophily. Um, why is it that networks take the shapes that they do? Um, there are three kinds of stories out there. Um, there are um, uh, uh, two of these come from um, uh, sociology. One comes from economics. And I think you spend two seconds looking at it. It's clear which is which, right? Um, so uh, status homophily. Um, is this idea, and by status, I don't mean, you know, like you're high status and I'm low status, simply that we, we, we group up with people who share similar cultural attributes, okay? Um, end of story. Um, value homophily, independent of our, of our other attributes, we feel justified, we, 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 we group up with people who share our beliefs. So, so one is, is that, is that, you know, that, oops, wrong one, is that, uh, you know, that, that, uh, 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 you know, is that, is that whites are friends with whites, blacks are friends with blacks, Jews with Jews, Christians with Christians, so on and so forth. That's status homophily. Value homophily, Republicans are friendly with each other, right? Of course, it's hard to distinguish sometimes value homophily and status homophily, in particular when looking at the Republican Party. But, um, um, but, um, uh, but that's a different story. And, and it's a really a very different story because we could imagine that um, if we had 
if, if status homophily were driving people together and values then emerged from those social interactions, right? The arrow would go of causality, of causation, would go from similar cultural backgrounds to similar beliefs. Um, but on the other hand, to the extent that, um, um, so if we, if, we wanna, if, we, if we see people on the other hand grouped by beliefs, right, we wanna know is that, is that in fact why they're grouped together or is that um, um, a result of their being grouped together? Um, uh, uh, opportunity homophily, not surprisingly, is this idea that the people we tend to bump into most, most are fellow economists, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> Gee, too bad. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, so, um, uh, uh, and it's very important, and I think something, that, and this is you know, one, of, one of economics' big contributions, right, is to understand that, that, that tastes are important and constraints are also important. And in the models that one sees of network formation, constraints are, um, uh, are often uh, um, uh, left off the table. Um, so um, how many of you uh, are, are, how many of you are actually planning on doing some network research and maybe know some network game theory, right? So I mean, a very interesting criticism, I think, of uh, um, one of my big criticisms, I don't know whether it's interesting, but, but my, um, one of the things that I don't like about this um, uh, notion of stability that that um, um, is that uh, that uh, uh, Jackson and 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 Walensky and then others have developed the various notions of stability, which is a game theoretic kind of solution, con a game theoretic way of of of, of identifying or uh, you know networks. Um, uh, one problem with this is that is that. Uh, um, part of those definitions, and I won't go into this at all in detail, but if you want to speak to me about it later, I'm happy to. Um, some of those definitions do not, um, a part of that definition, they don't take account of the fact that there are frictions involved in actually finding people, right, um, in actually grouping up with people, that there are constraints, right, that are operative on, on, on you know, on, 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 uh, you know, who you can actually interact with. Um, and so in particular, um, we could easily imagine that there are pairwise Pareto gains that are left on the table, right? Um, so um, uh, now the last thing we need in any kind of game theoretic network solution concept is to have more networks rather than less. We need more constraints, but in fact, I think we actually have too many. Um, okay. Um, uh, homophily actually gets us into trouble when we start thinking about, um, um, about behavior and the emergence of behavior on, 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 on networks. This is a picture which no doubt all of you recognize, right? So you all know that, that obesity is contagious, right? So this is the picture, <laughs> right? So this is, um, uh, you know, this, by the way, there is an art, right? And there is special software available, right, um, uh, for plotting out networks, right? So here's how you read this picture. Um, green people are not obese, okay? Yellow people are. Um, size of the node is the measure of BMI, body mass index. Okay, so it's very visual. Uh, purple links are links where there's a genetic relationship. Okay, right. Now, I mention this because this, I think, is the, is the, is the classic example, right, of, um, I've, I've read all of these papers reasonably carefully, um, and it's just, you know, there is no way in this kind of research to tell, in, in, in the research that was done for this paper, to tell which way the causal arrow is going, okay? Um, and and, um, uh, and uh, so identification, the, the, this is the problem that endogenous network formation creates for identification, okay? Um, uh, and I don't know if we're gonna have time to talk about it, but in a nutshell, this is it, right? Now, Stephen has a student, Ethan Cohen Cole, and Ethan wrote a very clever criticism of this work, and his co-author is a guy named Fletcher, Jason Fletcher, and I don't remember where it appeared. But it, I think it might be Journal of Health Economics? Right, okay. I think one of those is on my extended reading list, which is at the end of my slides. And so um, I, I would encourage you to take it where they discuss this, this important issue in much, in much greater detail. Um, uh, how might we measure the degree of homophily in a network? Um, uh, I want to move very quickly. Um, so um, uh, an obvious way to do it is um, let's just consider a network with two types of people, male and female, um, and let's uh, take our network 
and assign. So we're gonna we're now gonna we're not gonna construct a network, and we're gonna have this this network in place. But people don't have identities. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna assign gender randomly, okay, to um, uh, our nodes. If in our population, our subject population, say 40% are male and 60% are female, we will assign right to our nodes. Um, uh, we'll, we'll assign them. Um, uh, um, genders with a 40% probability of being a man, a 60% probability of being a, uh, a, a woman. All right, so that's kind of IID gender assignment. Now we can ask the question, what is the probability of a cross-gender edge? Okay, um, and uh, that probability, uh, if uh, fraction P are males, Q are females, then the probability of a cross-gender edge um, is, uh, is, if it were all IID, would be 2PQ. Okay, so if in fact, right, we see a fraction of cross-gender edges less than this, this is evidence that we're seeing a process whereby like links with like. And this has been turned into, um, one can do this in a more sophisticated way for, um, uh, for more different types, okay? Um, and what hasn't been done to the best of my knowledge um, is actually to, 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 you know, build dynamic models where one might actually study the evolution of this, you know, this kind of cross-gender ratio. Um, and so I don't know what kind of, you know, statistical properties it would have that would derive um, from a, um, uh, you know, from a theoretical model, but this is um, an important question. Um, let me turn to, um, have just wanted, I just want to touch base on some of these terms. Let me now turn to um, uh, the small world's stories. We mentioned this earlier, we talked about six degrees of separation. Here is what, um, um, th the key thing to know is that the original paper appeared in a journal called Psychology Today, okay? Uh, and, and uh, <laughs> all right, you know Psychology Today, right? There were, and it hasn't changed much, right? So it had, there was a follow-up paper in an academic journal by Travers and, 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 and Milgram, um, and that's where this stuff comes from. Um, uh, so the story is, as I said, they started out with some uh, uh, people in uh, Nebraska and a couple of target people in Boston. Um, they, uh, um, uh, they, they give a very fancy letter certificate to the people in Nebraska and say, get this to you know, these people in Boston. And, so, and, then what they, and, and, and everybody who gets the letter in passing signs their name and address to it and then sends it on to someone else. And so then Milgram uh, went back and looked at the uh, letters that were actually collected. First, he was able to see what fraction came through. And then second, he was able to see um, 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 uh, you know, how, many, how many links there were and where those links were, right? Um, and uh, um, and uh, it turned out typically that the first step was a very big step, like maybe two thirds of the way across the country. The next one was smaller, and it kind of gradually honed in. Um, now, um, this it, it's alleged that you see the small world's phenomena in a lot of places, like you know important economic websites like the Internet Movie Database, right? So um, you know where <laughs> um, the mean distance between you know any two actors where the notion of a link is that you know, two individuals were in the same movie, you know, the mean length is very small. I don't remember what it is. Does anyone remember? It's been talked about a lot, right? All right, so this, pardon? Seven? I think it's, I think it's, it's smaller than that. It gets bigger when you include Bollywood, right? <laughs> um, and, and Bollywood has been included, actually, right? So, so, um, so um, uh, Duncan Watts and, and Steve Strogatz, um, uh, developed a model uh, to talk, they, they had an idea, why is, it, why is it that social networks, how could it be that social networks have this property that um, people are, are uh, that uh, there are on the one hand so many nodes um, and yet, uh, and, and, and not that many edges and yet the um, average distance between people is so small. So here's a kind of an illustration. What they did was, here's the stochastic, they built a number of stochastic models and here's one of them, maybe the easiest one to explain. You can see I've got these people organized on a circle, right? So the idea is that if you're near to me in the circle, you're kind of like me, okay? So that's, we have homophily at work here. Uh, you'll notice that I've linked up everybody so that, that everybody is linked to their two nearest neighbors on either side. And so we get this wheel-like shape, okay? Now what Strogatz and Watts do is they come along and say, okay, well, let's take one edge, this edge right here, 
we draw an edge at random, that's the blue edge. Uh, we disconnect it, and now what we do is we reconnect it to another person at random, okay? And, um, and then we uh, do it again. We disconnect another edge and we reconnect it, um, uh, uh, we disconnect one edge of it and we reconnect it at random. You do this a very few times, okay? Uh, oops, I didn't want to do that yet. Um, we do this a very few times, and what happens is that, is that mean distance, the, I'm sorry, not mean distance, but the maximal distance between two people fall really quite quickly, okay? Um, and I think I, I have some statistics on it. And the idea here um, is um, that, um, hang on, just one second. Um, Okay, um, so this is called the random rewiring model. And what actually happens is that, um, so if we imagine that, that we have a very, very large number of people, each with a very number of sm a small number of edges initially, um, what happens is that, is that the, um, um, the, the, mean, uh, the mean path length between individuals falls rather rapidly. This is the key thing, the key property of the model is that is that as we let the population size get very large and we keep the number of degree, the, the degree fixed, okay, um, uh, and we want that to be much smaller than the population, what's gonna happen is that the clustering coefficient is gonna remain the same. These graphs are gonna remain very, very highly cl clustered. But just the few small random edges that we've thrown in Right, that we've unwired and rehooked, they have an effect of lowering the clustering coefficient, but they really change path lengths a lot. So the mean path length falls dramatically when you do this, right? And yet the um, um, the graph still stays very highly clustered. So this is a way of understanding how you can have graphs that have some of these features, right? That we see in in in, in social networks. And so much has been made of random graphs, and there have been, I mean, I'm sorry, of small of so-called small worlds graphs that are just constructed by stochastic properties such as this. And people study diffusion on them, they study you know, uh, epidemiology on them, rumors, all kinds of different things. It's, a, it's, a, um, uh, you know, it's one of those viruses that keeps on feeding itself, right, and keeps going. Now, um, uh, s pardon? Oh dear, <laughs> just so, right. Uh, um, yeah, but the people who become infected stay infected. They don't become resistant. That's the problem. Um, uh, so it's, it's SI, not, 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 not SIR. Um, the, uh, um, uh, it's important to know that this is not the only way in which you can have social networks that look the way we do. So here's a story. Um, here's a conversation that happened between my wife and a friend that she ran into on the street on the east side of Manhattan. This is not my wife. All right, I'll, I'll tell you about her in a minute. Um, uh, uh, my wife bumped into a friend. This honestly happened the week when I was writing these slides, okay? She mentioned that she had been out, um, 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 and she lives in Manhattan, and she'd been out on the street, and she ran into somebody she hadn't seen in years and years on the street, and she said, oh, what a small world it is, and the friend said, no, it's a stratified world, not a small world, right? Um, and, 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 and that's a very different story for why we might expect to see um, small path lengths because we don't tend, you know, for, um, that this is kind of what, 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 what causes the agglomeration. The reason, um, this picture here, this is a picture of a woman named uh, Lois Weisberg. And um, Lois Weisberg lives here in Chicago. How many of you have ever heard of Lois Weisberg? You have, right? You have. Jim, you must have heard of Lois Weisberg, right? So Lois Weisberg is something like the highest degree person in the world. Okay, you want something to happen. She's now, she's now in, she must be close to 90, so maybe she's not so active anymore. But there was a time when if you wanted to get something done in the city of Chicago, you would call Lois Weisberg. Now, how do I know this? Because Malcolm Gladwell wrote an essay about Lois Weisberg, all right? And, and, and this was his anti-six degrees thing. He wanted to say that we have another way of understanding why we can see the kind of path lengths we do is that we have a few people who are very, very high degree, and everything goes through them. All right? Now, if you actually go and look at Milgram's small world data, it turns out, actually, that the majority of stuff that made it to the target in one of his runs, I think it was the run that ended up in Providence, everything went through, not everything, but most things went through a single individual who 
he was a very well-connected individual in Rhode Island somewhere, and stuff just funneled to him and then went, you know, and then went to these different places, right? So it's, it, this is another reason for why social networks could look the way that they, that they do. Um, and just to round out the story, I'll tell you that my wife lived in Chicago, and I kind of lived in Chicago, in the, uh, um, in the uh, early 1980s. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it turned out that when my wife lived here, she knew Lois Weisberg, right? really is a high degree person. So, so there are lots of stories out there about particular kinds of graphs, particular kinds of graph theoretic models, right? Um, but there are a lot of ways of generating the, particular, the kinds of phenomena that we see. And it's important to think about, uh, to think about, about, about all of them. Um, now let me turn to labor markets. And I'm just gonna blow by this slide because you all know this stuff at least as well as I do. We've had rising inequality. Um, we've had more rising inequality, right? A lot of rising inequality, right? I originally did these slides for a group of people who weren't labor economists and I wanted to talk about labor markets, okay? Um, so I'm not gonna talk about this. I wanna talk about how you find a job, okay? Um, <laughs> I did too. All right, all right. Everybody feel better? <laughs> Inhale. Right. Uh, okay. Um, uh, I wanted to make the case, right, that, um, that dispersion in wages and stuff seemed to be growing um, at all scales of measurement. You can look at aggregate wages. You can look at wages within labor markets. It was actually hard to document this last part. And so I went to some of my economists. My, my labor colleagues, uh, we have a Department of Labor Economics at Cornell, and I went and I asked a couple of them um, uh, if they knew where I could find some evidence um, uh, that I could display for this, for this fact that I first learned from my colleague Bob Frank, uh, that, uh, uh, where he claimed that, that if you look at, at labor markets at any scale, you see increasing returns dispersion. Um, uh, but of course, he didn't document that, so I asked some of my colleagues, and, and, and the ones I spoke to said, um, gee, this, this, I believe this to be true, but it's hard to think of a paper. And finally, someone, and I don't remember the source. I, it's in my notes. I don't want to take the time to find it, but the reason that this is there is that someone did some kind of decomposition and says, yes, that, that th there's uh, increasing uh, wage dispersion between occupations, but there's also increasing wage dispersion within occupational categories at a very, very grand, you know, fine-grained uh, level of analysis. It may be true, it may not be exactly true, right? You will know better than I. I don't want to defend that fact. But what I do want to talk about is how do people find jobs, right? And this is a chart that comes, a, a, a table that comes from a paper of, um, uh, from James Montgomery, who is an economist, an anomalous person, who's an economist who has a position in a sociology department at Wisconsin. Um, and, um, uh, and, uh, uh, and what you see in this table, right, um, through all these different studies done at different points in time, is that when we look at, at how people find jobs, lots of people find jobs through personal contacts. Friends, friends of friends, professional contacts. Believe me, when you become a senior person, you're going to get angry with your department chair. You're going to pick up the phone. You're not going to run an ad saying, hire me. You know, We don't have a, a jobs wanted section of Joe, as far as I know. right? But you're going to work your phone network, right? And, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so how is it that social networks are organized to find jobs? So Mark Granovetter uh, is a sociologist at Stanford. and um, and he um, asked this question, um, and uh, he came. He he noticed the following. Um, I must have this written down. Um, in in um, so what he did in and uh, this was I believe his thesis research actually um, was that uh, he looked at uh, he went to Newton, Massachusetts, and he looked at people and managers and professional people who were changing jobs, and he asked. Um, uh, people, how they, you know, how they found their new jobs. And from the people who asked their, you know, who said, I found a job through a contact, he asked the question, well, how often are you in touch with that contract? You know, how often do you see this person? And, um, um, and here's what he found. Uh, he found that, um, um, uh, I think he asked the question, uh, how did he phrase it? Um, uh, did you see them often, occasionally, or rarely? Often, meaning people who are close to you, 17%, um, 16.7%. Uh, Occasionally, 55.6%. 
Um, rarely 27.8%, right? So most people, right, who found jobs through contacts found them through contacts that were not especially close to them, right? That's a striking fact, okay? And um, um, he then, uh, it turned out that people, when he found, people who found jobs, you know, didn't necessarily talk to the person who had the job. They, they talked to someone who said, gee, I know of someone who has a job. Right? Or I know of someone who knows of someone who might be looking. How long are those paths? Um, and um, uh, let's see. So um, uh, let's see. So I have to read this the right way. 3.1% um, uh, had path length more than two. Um, um, yes, 12.5% had were two link paths. 45.3 were one link beyond. I, I, I actually should up these numbers by one. Three, two, 45 percent, one, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, four were more than, 3.1 uh, percent were more than three. 12.5 um, percent were more than two, more than two. 45.3 percent were more than one, and 39.1 percent was, yes, I have a job, okay, or I know directly of a job, all right. So, Jobs are percolating, job referrals are percolating through this network, fact one, right? And not, not just a trivial distance, but a bit of a distance. And then fact two, right? The people who are, who are uh, making these referrals are people who people are not tightly connected to. Um, so, um, oh. There's another study, uh, I think I won't take the time to talk about it. Uh, my, my, uh, um, my, um, my references have a, uh, a, a link to a paper by uh, um, Anatole Rappaport and Rappaport and Horvath, written in 1961. Um, they asked, uh, they went to a Michigan medical school and they asked people to uh, list their eight best friends in order. And then what they did was they, uh, they constructed artificial networks. They said, what network do I get if I, t if I link people up only to their two best friends and then look at the two best friends network, right? Um, and what percentage of the school do I span? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, at the other extreme, and they did it for every pairing, you go to the other extreme, what network do I get if I link people up only to their seventh and eighth best friends? And it turned out that the seventh and eighth best friends network had a much larger span than the best friends. Because obviously your best friends of your best friends are going to be your best friends, right? But your eighth best friend of your eighth best friend is someone who you don't even know, right? All right, so, so these networks had very large spans. Um, and um, this led, this kind of thinking led Granovetter to, to, to um, draw an, a, a distinction which has become important in, 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 uh, in studying job search. And this is the distinction between um, strong and weak ties. Okay? And the title of, of his, his, his key article, which appeared, I think, in 73 in the American Journal of Sociology, AS, uh, ASR, it was American Sociology Review, was uh, the strength of weak ties, okay? And his idea is that it's weak ties um, to, um, uh, that, that um, uh, get people jobs. So why are weak ties powerful things, okay? So I want to start here um, by noticing we have two cliques, okay? And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw another, another link, and this AB link essentially serves the purpose of being a bridge, right? It connects the bottom clique down here with the, with the top clique up here. Um, and, uh, um, uh, and so it provides a way in which information um, um, can, can uh, you know, flow back and forth. Um, now, if we had a network that looked like this, we might, so, so Granovetter's idea was, and I'm going to explain how he came to this in just a second, is that, is that we might imagine that these links here, where everybody's all connected up, that these are strong links, and this might be a weak link. And the idea, so what does he, what does he mean when he talks about strong versus weak ties? His measure of tie, right, that he deployed for his studies was exactly this notion of how often do I see you, okay? And he, he made this he, he quantified this and then used this as a measure of, um, as the measure of tie strength. But what he did was, instead of measuring a continuum of tie strengths, which is what all of us would want to do, he just broke things down into strong and weak ties. Um, and his hypothesis is that if we have cliques that are, 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 are disconnected and then they get connected, um, these are uh, more like, this is not likely to be a strong tie. 
Okay, it's more likely to be a weak tie. Here's a situation where we have, um, uh, uh, oftentimes, it's not going to be the case that social networks look like clique, 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 with a single bridge between each one. Okay, so here we have um, uh, uh, two connections. Um, Granovetter refers to this as the local bridge, and 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 his point is is that if you have um, uh, what is his definition of a, uh, a a local bridge? His idea of his definition of a local bridge is that you have um, uh, a link um, between uh, if you a local bridge is a link between two people who have no common friends. Okay, so. A and B don't have any friends in common except for each other. This guy here, who we'll call C, and this guy down here, D, also have no friends together. Okay. Um, um, now, Granovetter suggests that the following is true. He said as a, his operational um, uh, idea was, he said that strong ties are going to be characterized by the property um, that... Um, um, that these are hom hom homophilic ties, okay? And so he says it will be the case, I'm going to postulate, he says, that, that if I have a length two path containing only strong edges, then that path is going to be closed into a triangle, okay? And, and he claims uh, that this is characteristic of uh, many social networks. He doesn't have any empirical work on this. You'll notice, for example, that that's a good example. Here we have uh, a strong link, strong link, and now we have, and it's closed with another strong link. Here we have strong link, strong link, it's a length two path. It's closed off, but with a weak link, okay? Notice that if his hypothesis is true, is that paths that are, length two paths that are strong are going to be, clo uh, uh, um, are going to be closed in some way with either a strong or a weak length. The only paths that can perform this bridging function are weak length paths, right? So Granovetter's idea is that weak length paths reach out of your, you know, out of your close set, right? Out of your cluster of friends, and they are valuable to you for two reasons. Okay, number one, they bring you very different information than your other links are going to get. So if we look at this guy here. And he's got three strong buddies, one, two, three, all of them, right? Um, you know, any information that he gets, you know, if he gets something from, th from this guy, he's liable to get the same thing from this guy over here because, you know, they're, um, uh, most of their data sources are the same. Um, on the other hand, when you have a, when you have a, uh, um, a link that's a bridge, right, you're getting very fresh data. Weak links in Granovetter's formulation are more likely to be bridges and therefore are going to provide you with different information. The second idea he has is that weak links are valuable because they're not as expensive to maintain. This is, this is a sociologist who's really thinking like an economist, right? He says, you know, friendships, number one, friendships are all about my needs, right? Um, and then number two, right, it's expensive to maintain strong links. You have to see these people. I have to go out with them, you know. Uh, <laughs> right? Weak links, on the other hand, are easy to maintain, so you can have more of them, right? And, 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 and so for both of these reasons, we might imagine that weak links are valuable. Yes? Mm-hmm. All right, so, so he is, he is um, when he writes about this, I think that he is thinking that processes of network formation, when they go on, go on on a time scale which is slower than that of the process of the job search itself, okay? And, and now, now, obviously, you know, in, in, in an economy like today's, that's probably false, right? Um, I mean, in, in the sense that you might actually um, spend, you might spend time actually constructing a network precisely to get yourself a job, right? So, so um, um, 
uh, and you'll spend a lot of time making contacts and stuff like that. But in a healthy economy, we might imagine that things might move, turn over a little bit quicker. This is the idea that Granovetter had in mind. Um, it's certainly true that there is a, you know, that, that, that weak links can turn into strong links. So, I, you know, I, you're a weak link uh, to me. And then I, you tell me about a job at your place. Well, now, gee, now we're hanging out together, so we become a strong link. And in the meantime, some of my old buddies were work buddies, and so they become weaker. This dynamic does work. And so, um, uh, uh, and I think that that poses a, um, um, you have to think about what kind of challenge that poses for empirical work, right? Because, you know, what's relevant at the end of the day is, 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 is not, not how strong my links are at the end, but how strong were they when I was looking for the job. He, Granovetter is not worried so much about what a link, any particular link is at any moment. He just says at any moment, if you get a referral, right, that referral is very likely to come from a weak link uh, because it won't be something you've already heard um, because you have lots of weak links, okay? Um, uh, and, 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 and that's an argument that makes sense whether you think about networks as being static or dynamic, right? But, it, but the dynamism that you're talking about creates problems, I think, for, for, for measurement, especially when we do the kind of ex post measurement that Granovetter did. Okay, yes? Right. This is this is a, a point that's disputed in the literature. Okay. Right. So Granovetter says Granovetter says it's the it's the um, uh, that it's the quality of information that matters. And other people say no, it's really the numbers. And and this is an empirical argument between sociologists, and therefore probably not one that we should get involved with. Um, uh, I can't I can't um, um, I don't have a lot to say about that. But but I think. My point is just that both, both arguments are out there. And Granovetter certainly does take a stand. Okay. Um, um, and I could imagine building models that would tell you either story. Right? I don't think it would be hard to do that. Um, uh, whether, whether you could find, I don't, I, I'm not sure that you, could, you know, that you could actually find a way to tell. Yeah. No, but if, if we call the links blue and red, mm-hmm. Right. Well, remember. Well, yeah, but but remember that that you're impl- don't make the implicit mistake of thinking that of, of treating all the information as being IID, right? I mean, so Granovetter's whole point, right, or not his whole point, but one of his points, right, is that is that strong links share common information sources, right? Yeah. Right. So I might have I might have a, a um, I might have five strong links and only one weak link, but I get two pieces of data, one five times from my friends who are my strong links and my second one from the other guy. Exactly. So right. That would, yeah, that would and that's, and that's, and that's, and that's Granovetter's story, right? Um, um, and I don't remember the name I associate with, I, I can't remember the name of the other people who made the other argument. It says, but gee, but you just got a lot of, you got a lot of those blue things, whatever you want to call them. Um, uh, and, 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 um, and, then, and we should actually think about what, and I don't want to do this in real time, but what difference it would make for, you know, um, kind of uh, thinking about policies to mobilize networks to help people find jobs. It, it must make a difference, and I, but I don't want to think how that's going to work in real time. Nor do I want to take the time for anyone else to think about it, because I have a lot of stuff to talk about. Yeah. Well, if you're... If, <laughs> If, if if you're that way, none at all. <laughs> all right, but but if you're um, no no. So so, um, Granovetter does not have the idea that we opportunistically form these networks merely for the purpose of finding jobs. Right. So so his idea is that these are networks that are pre-existing networks. Right. Uh, networks that come you know from from old school friendships and 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 and, and church and you know your wife's friends and stuff like that. All right, so so um, um, 
Uh, so he's not thinking about this as a strategic network formation game. And thinking about how this intersects with strategic network formation is interesting to do. Okay? Yeah. Um, he does. He does not, because he's not that sophisticated in the modeling tools that he deployed back in the 1970s when he was thinking about this. A lot of the tools that we'd use today aren't there. You could imagine it would be easy to to do some simulation stuff pretty quickly. Um, I, by quickly, I mean you could get it knocked up before the this 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 le lecture ends, especially if I go as long as Jim does. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and 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 the and and. Um, uh, uh, but you can, I, and my first, I think it would be not hard to do, and I could imagine building analytical models. The analytical models would be kind of hard, but I could certainly imagine doing some simulation stuff pretty quickly. Um, uh, you know, so, so clearly, you know, everybody benefits from the fact that, uh, that guy A has this link, okay? Um, and I'll show you in just a little bit a model that gets you to that, okay? Um, all right, so let me now show you, um, uh, a model that was developed by Jim Montgomery to talk about the effects of social structure in a labor market. Okay, so um, what? I think so. I I I think that that and and I think that. Um, you know, there's very interesting stuff on what, when is search efficient on a network, right? And, and John Kleinberg actually wrote a, a, a very well-known paper where he shows that, if the, that, that there are particular link distributions that make it very easy to find things on networks. Um, uh, and I was actually thinking of lecturing on it, but I don't have time. Uh, so the macro, no, the macro guys don't think about this, about this kind of stru structure, putting this kind of structure into search at all, okay? I think I th I think I think that's right. Um, so and I think that's so right that in a couple of minutes I'm going to show you some slides of a model of Matt Jackson that explains why in fact that's harder than you think. Okay. Um, um, uh, so so. First, let me, let me talk about what Jim does. And, and what Jim does, having talked about strong and weak links, uh, I'm going to tell you that in this paper, Montgomery, uh, this is, uh, comes, from the, comes from the AER. I should actually tell you what the reference is. Um, uh, again, you'll find it on my, uh, uh, wherever, you know, you'll find it in the back. Um, get over there. This comes from 1991. Um, and he's got a couple of papers in sociology journals and in the American Economic Review that, and this is the AER paper I'm showing you that talk about this. Now, all that he's going to do in this paper, it's, it's, it's much smaller. He's, not, he's going to have a very, very primitive social structure. Okay? Um, and what he wants to do is to, to, to take a flat economic style market, okay? you know, a flat anonymous market, add social structure to it in a very, very minimal way, and demonstrate that this has implications for both the absolute level of wages and the spread of wages. Okay? Um, uh, so, um, uh, and what's impressive about this is, is you do very little in the way of assumptions, in the way of adding social structure at all, and then you see these very, very, um, um, uh, uh, you know, big effects. Uh, and then we'll see that, that it's easy to get too excited about that because when you start actually building social networks more seriously, it becomes more difficult. We'll see that too. All right, so here's this model. We're going to have workers... Um, we're going to have uh, the same number of workers in each of two periods. Um, half of the workers are high ability, and they produce one. Half of the workers are low ability, and they produce zero. Okay? Um, uh, and uh, workers are observationally indistinguishable. Okay? Uh, so if you're, going to, if you're a firm and you're going to go, uh, each firm employs one worker, um, and um, uh, the profit to the, to the firm is the uh, employee productivity either one or zero minus the wage, right? And the wage is not output dependent. The wage is you, 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 you pay a fixed wage rate, 
okay? Um, uh, there's going to be free entry of entrepreneurs, and we're going to have, uh, and, the, and, and our entrepreneurs are going to be risk neutral. Our firms are going to be maximizing expected profits. So the equilibrium condition in this model, if this, if this were all there were to the model, right, the equilibrium condition is that firms' expected profit is zero. That will, in fact, be the equilibrium condition because of the free entry assumption. That expected profit is zero. Wage offers are going to be the expected productivity, right? So if I don't know anything about the workers, and I know that half are good, half are bad, and I can't tell the difference between them, wage is going to be one half, right, if there's only one period. It's going to get better, okay? Um, so... Uh, now let's talk about social structure. So remember that we have workers who are coming into the market at time one, and then workers, again, who come into the market at time two. Each time one worker, we'll think of these as old workers, knows no more than one young worker, time two worker. Okay? So I'm the old guy at the plant, and I know some young guy like Durloff over there, right? And so I am in a position to refer him to my boss because he's perennially out of a job. Um, all right, so each worker has a, has a has, so I either have a social tie or I don't, right? Each worker, either, old worker either has a social tie or not. Tau is the probability that there is a social tie. And so we'll think about tau as measuring network density. That is that a lot of, there, there's a lot of social ties if tau is large, if it's near one, very few if tau is near zero. Um, but just to be clear, even though each old worker, right, has only, has only um, uh, one friend, um, the friends are kind of chosen um, at random, and we're going to put some structure on that. You can already, you've already read it, I'm sure. But it could well be the case that any young worker is actually tied up to several old workers. All right? So we might imagine that there's two young workers, two old workers. One old, both old workers have a social tie to the same young worker, and the other worker has none at all. Okay, so that's possible. Um, second, um, uh, there's going to be what uh, 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 Montgomery charmingly refers to as an in, inbreeding bias, namely, okay, that the uh, probability conditional on having a tie, that person is more likely, with probability alpha greater than one half, is, is, is the probability that he's of your type. So if you're a good worker, then with probability one half, so is he, okay? And uh, if you're a bad worker, similarly, all right? Um, all right, so that's the social structure. Um, the timing of the model. Firms hire period one workers, and the only place to get period one workers is in the anonymous market, okay? And that's going to clear at some wage rate, WM1. Um, then production occurs each... Um, you have to pay your worker WM1, no matter how good or how bad he is, but you learn, okay, from him, um, uh, you learn that worker's productivity, okay? So at the end of the first period, you know whether you've hired a good guy or a lemon, uh, and you've paid him. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, you, it, you, you set, if you're a firm, you now say, uh, you now set a referral wage. You say to your, uh, to your employee, if you come with me, uh, if, you, if, you, if you provide me with a referral, I will pay that person a certain amount, okay? D that's WRF, and this is what you're going to pay for the second period worker, okay? Then we have the assignment of social ties. It doesn't actually matter when social ties are assigned. The point is that uh, um, 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 uh, that should be WRF2, that... that uh, um, the, tau, the, 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 tau, the, the time one workers have their social ties. They relay these offers to their social tie. The time two workers decide either to accept the offer or enter an anonymous labor market. Okay? So at the end of the first period, I, the firm, make an offer, tell you that if you have someone to refer to me, I will um, uh, hire them and pay them. W, WR, all right, or W, I, I just WRF, right? Um, you then tell your friend, and your friend decides whether or not he wants to come and work for me or we'll enter the anonymous labor market, okay? Is that clear? Okay. Um, uh, then the period two labor market clears, and then we have second pr period production, and time comes to an end, okay? So that's the whole story, all right? Everybody got it? Okay. Now, um, uh, so what's the equilibrium going to going to look like. Um, 
And most of these are kind of obvious when you think about them for a minute, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time or maybe even any time explaining them. Um, 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 okay. Um, so the first fact is, is that, is that um, wow, I don't, did I put all this on the slide? I, uh, yes, okay. Um, so the first fact is that, is that, uh, is that uh, only firms with type one workers, good workers, are actually going to bother to even make a referral offer. In other words, if you have a bad worker, you're going to say, I'm going to pay your friend zero. Okay? Uh, and um, um, so only firms with good workers are going to make referral offers. Referral wage offers are going to be distributed on an interval. Okay? Um, and the reason is, um, is that the probability that a type time two worker receives exactly one offer is strictly between zero and one. Now, if you were a graduate student in the 80s, you would have studied a labor, uh, you would have studied a search model that was due to a guy named Gerald Butters, um, whose job, first job was at Princeton. And, um, uh, uh, and um, the issue that he addressed was, how do I, how, how could it be the case that we have diffuse prices in markets, that there's not a single price. And so he built a kind of a, uh, a simple search mo model. It was, a, he, it was about advertising in his case, um, which led to an equilibrium with a, necessarily, with a necessary distribution of wages. What Montgomery did was to take the minimum twist on that model um, and bring it into this labor market context. And when he did, um, so there's all this stuff out there that this is kind of this canonical butters model for reasons that I don't want to talk about at all. Um, there's going to be an interval on which wage offers are distributed for the referrals. Um, and the lower bound is going to be what you could get in the anonymous market in the second period. And there is an upper bound. One can prove things about the comparative statics of that that I'm not going to talk about. Um, for uh, for the, uh, the, the second period labor market, the anonymous market, has to have a wage less than one half. Because we might imagine the only people who are getting, um, uh, who, are, who are the only People, the only old workers who have referral offers to hand out are type one workers. Their friends are more likely to be type one guys. Okay, some of those guys are going to disappear, right? And so, therefore, the fraction of workers who are in the um, uh, uh, who, the the fraction of good guys who are in the anonymous work market is going to be less than one half because some of the good workers were kind of skimmed off by the referral process, OK? Um, uh, and that means that the anonymous wage is going to be less than 1 half. Second period profits are going to be positive, OK? Why are second period profits going to be positive? Second period profits are going to be positive because the firm actually has a bit of market power. Why does the firm have market power in the second period? The firm has market power in the second period because the fellow, there is some probability that the fellow with whom I'm negotiating with in the referral market has only one referral, you know, namely he only has one friend who gave him a referral offer, okay? And so, and, and, and if he doesn't take my offer, you know, I know that it's likely, right, that he is a type one guy, okay, a good guy. But if he doesn't take my offer, he's got to go into the anonymous labor market and get a wage rate of less than one half, right? This gives me market power. So I don't actually have to pay him his expected marginal product, okay? I can pay him a little bit less, okay? Uh, and, and, um, uh, and so uh, expected profits in the second period are, uh, profits in the second period are positive. Remember our overall equilibrium condition is that profits are zero. What is the effect of that in the first period? It's to raise, wages in the first period above one half. Remember that one half was the expected, was the, was the uh, average uh, uh, productivity of a worker, right? So why is it now raised, raised above one half? Well, if I get a low quality worker, well, then he's, he's worth zero. He doesn't produce anything for me. And for, furthermore, he's not going to be of any help to me in the labor market, OK? But suppose I get a high worker. Not only do I get his output of one, OK, but I also get to make expected positive expected profits in the second period, right, from what he's going to refer, you know, from the referral that he's going to make. OK, so consequently, the value to me of having a type one worker, right, is both his output today and his referral, the profits I'm going to make from his referral tomorrow. 
First period equilibrium says expected, expected profits have to be equal to zero, so that just pushes up the first period wage rate. That's the nature of the equilibrium, okay? So what are the effects of social structure? It lowers the second period salaries in the anonymous market. The, um, um, uh, the workers who get referrals, there's some distribution of wages um, uh, out there. Um, first period rate wages are increased, okay? Um, uh, and so, we can see how the presence of social structure has actually changed us from the simple one half in the first period, one half in the second period, everybody getting paid the same. Okay. Um, what are the effects of increasing either the degree of inbreeding or the density of social contacts? Lowers, again, uh, uh, and you can imagine, I'm not going to tell these stories. Um, uh, you can read the article. It's actually only a four or five page article. Um, uh, but there's going to be more, if you do either of these things for different reasons, more high quality workers will get skimmed off into the referral market in the second period. That means that the anonymous market is going to work, look worse, so wages are going to go down. Um, the top wage has to go up for reasons having to do with the search stuff that I'm not talking about. Not surprisingly, profits have to go up in the second period because they're, you're more likely now through a referral, if you've got a good guy, you're going to get a better worker. Um, uh, and because profits in the second period are going up, it means that market wages in the first period have to go up as well. Okay, um, so in some sense, the more social, you know, the, the denser the network, right? Um, um, the uh, um, uh, I, I guess the worst thing, you know, the, the nature. Of the, where does the inequality come from in this? The inequality comes. The worst thing in the world is to have a to have an unproductive friend, right? If you're, if you're a second period worker with an unproductive friend, right, your wage is just, you know, is, is, is less, you know, is, uh, is you're going to go end up in the anonymous market, you're getting this wage which is, uh, um, you know, which is low, and the, the more dense the social structure, the richer the social structure, the lower your wage is going to be, okay? Um, um, so this is the comparison to the uh, market only model. Um, um, so in some sense, we see more inequality due to the social structure. Interestingly, even though the wage rates, um, uh, the total wage bill in the second period turns out to be less with all the social structure. Um, uh, again, because of the monopoly position that the, um, um, the, 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 the small degree of market power that firms find themselves having. Now, um, um, so the point of this is just to say, right, that number one, it's an example of how we can actually merge a story of social structure into a real economic model, something that all of you have studied, right? Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going through this very quickly because I have only half an hour left and there's a lot of stuff more than I have time to say given that I'm only a third of the way through my slides. Um, uh, and, uh, um, but I think that, um, uh, you know, you need to see how to do this, right? And, and it can be done. And this model, on the one hand, is really primitive. But on the other hand, there's not too much out there that is more sophisticated than this, right? Um, and uh, so again, I, I want to suggest that there are great opportunities for doing research with this kind of stuff. Because uh, um, this is a really shallow social structure story um, grafted onto a simple search model in the, in, in, in the simplest possible way. Um, and it has some really interesting facts, and I think facts that people would not have predicted ex ante. Although the minute you see the comparative statics, if you're reading the paper, you say, oh, sure, of course. Right? It's that kind of paper. Um, so now I want to talk about another model to show you what happens. So we have a model now that actually has social structure in the sense, what was the social network in the last model? The social network in the last model um, was a directed graph where... Um, Every, uh, where the uh, mean degree was, so let's, let's look at the, it was a bipartite graph. What do I mean by a bipartite graph? We have two kinds of nodes, old workers and young workers, right? We have links, the only links that exist are links from the old workers to the young workers. The mean degree of the young workers is one, okay? Um, and, uh, um, and, uh, uh, and, and what, is the, uh, what does the graph look like? That the, not only the mean degree, and for the old workers, the mean degree is one, but furthermore, the variance is zero, 
right? So we have these graphs that are, are kind of spiky, right? So you'll have one young worker with maybe several edges coming into them. You'll have another worker with none at all. And on average, each worker has one edge, young worker has one edge coming into him. So that's not a terribly interesting kind of network. Um, so now what I want to do is talk about um, uh, a dynamic Markov model of, um, of, of, of networks and search in order to talk a bit about how network structure matters. And in this, this model, which is derivative, it's a variation on a model that was developed by Matt Jackson and Tony Calvo Armengol. Um, uh, this shows, uh, I think, some of the complexities that can arise. So this model appeared, again, references in the notes, uh, appeared in two places. Actually, it's discussed in, um, in Matt Jackson's book. Um, it's uh, also in, uh, there's an AER article and there's a paper in JET. Um, and um, uh, the model that I'm going to describe is not their model exactly, because it's a model that makes the calculation simpler. Um, uh, and uh, so let's see what that look, looks like. Uh, we're going to have discrete time. We're going to have n individuals. Um, we're going to have a symmetric adjacency matrix, right? So if I'm linked to you, you're linked to me. We're not going to do anything with structured generations or anything like that. Um, there's going to be a, we're not, we're not, we're not even going to talk about wages. There's some fixed wage rate out there. People want work, okay? Um, uh, and, uh, um, and at any moment in time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a description of who has a job and who doesn't have a job, OK? And that is called the configuration of the, uh, uh, of the uh, population. Uh, so type 0 is unemployed. Type 1 is employed. Um, now, um, ah, OK. Um, so here's how the dynamics work. Um, um, With probability p plus q, which is going to be less than 1, or less than or equal to 1, something is going to happen. There's going to be what we'll call a job event. With probability p over p plus q, conditional on a job event happening, with probability p over p plus q, um, uh, a job is created. With probability q over p plus q, a job is lost. OK? All right? So we're going to have a job event with probability p plus q. That means that with some probability, nothing happens at all. Okay? And if you'd like, it, there's no loss in generality in thinking that there's a job event every period so that p plus q sum to 1. All right? So with probability p, a job is created. With probability 1 minus p, a job is lost. Okay? Um, and um, what's the probability that a, uh, an employed person loses a job well, if there are k employed people? people um, um, I think I did this the wrong way around. Um, the probability, oh, yes. Yeah. So um, I wrote the wrong thing here because I actually rewrote these notes this morning, and this was a big mistake. So basically, what happens is that is that is that if there are k employed people, um, the prob and and a job law and 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 a uh, someone is going to lose a job with probability one over k. It's you. Okay, that's what I want you to know. Okay. Um, now, what happens when a job comes? That's the key thing. What happens when a job comes? When a job comes, um, um, someone is going to hear. Only one person is going to hear about that job. It's going to be a referral from outside the network. Okay. If you're unemployed and you get the referral, guess what? You're going to take the job. Okay. If not, you're going to turn to one of your unemployed friends, if you have one, chosen at random, and uh, uh, and. Um, and, uh, 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 and hand the offer off to that person, and of course that person will take it. And if it turns out that all of your friends are employed, then the referral is going to die. Okay? Now you might imagine that it would be interesting to pass it on to a friend, to a friend of a friend, so on and so forth. Um, and that's something that you might, you know, you might try working that out on your own. Okay? Um, uh, if it, by the way, if it bounces around the network in the same period, until it reaches someone who's unemployed, the model becomes very uninteresting. If there actually takes time for referrals to percolate through the network, the model becomes more complex. And that would be the thing to study, and that would be pretty interesting. OK. Um, OK. Uh, so that's the dynamics. OK. So basically, 
remember that a st this is now we're, we're, what I'm describing is, is a Markov process, right? These random job events happen, someone gets a referral, or else someone loses a job, okay? Um, a, uh, remember that our state space for this Markov process is the space of what I call configurations of the population, namely a specification of who is employed and who is unemployed. Yeah, well, well, the thing is that, that, that either a job is created or a job is lost or nothing happens. So there's total conservation of the number of jobs. No, 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 I'm sorry, that's not true. Uh, there's not total conservation. No, but, but, but you don't, the point is, is that you only have one event in a period. In a period, either a job is created or a job is lost or nothing happens, right? That's actually what that says right there, right? Either a job is created or a job is lost. But, but it's not the case that if, if, if unemployment it's not the case that if employment goes way down that the rate of job creation goes up, but you might imagine that the likelihood that a job is going to be lost in the referral process goes down. Okay? And so there is a, a kind of picking up at the bottom and a slowing down at the top because if you've got masses of employed people and only a few unemployed people, the likelihood that a referral is going to get to them is very small. Okay? All right. Um, so what I've done here is I've wrote that, written down transition probabilities. Um, remember the AIJs are either zero or one, and those are just kind of meaning, you know, formulas that we don't really, you can unpack on your own. I guess that's what I want to say. Now the interesting thing about this is suppose that we have um, a situation where we have two unemployed people um, who are surround, you know, who surround an employed person. Okay, well. Clearly what's going to happen, that the state of these people in the next period is going to be negatively correlated. Okay? Why is it going to be negatively correlated? Because um, either one of them is going to get a job. Uh, one possibility is that, is that either nothing happens or the job referral goes somewhere else entirely in the network and, and this whole configuration doesn't change. Okay? Or it could be the case that um, one of these two people gets a job independently, and if one gets it, the other one doesn't. If the referral comes to me, it doesn't come to you. The third possibility is that the guy in the center gets the job offer, or hears about the job, and he passes it on either to me or to you, but he can't pass it on to us both. So that if there's any change in the status of one of us, there cannot be a change in the status of the other. So there's kind of a short-term negative correlation. Okay, between, between people of the same employment status. Okay? But that doesn't describe what's happening in the long run. Okay? What happens in the long run is something different. Um, we have to describe what we mean, what, what the long run is going to look like. Um, what I've described for you is a, is a Markov process, right? a Markov chain. All right? And um, um, Markov chains have invariant distributions. It is... It is um, and, 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 and so um, what we're going to do, um, and by the way, this is uh, irreducible in a periodic Markov chain. Um, uh, you can see that it's possible to get to zero, all zeros from any state, simply because everybody simply loses their job, one after the other after the other. That happens with positive probability, right? So all states can reach that state, and from that state you can reach any other state just by Assigning the jobs the right way, right? That's a positive probability event. So you can get from anywhere to anywhere else. So this Markov process is ergodic, okay? So naturally, what do we want to do? You think, ah, ergodic Markov chain, right? Invariant distribution. Let's find the invariant distribution, okay? That's going to be our equilibrium notion. Um, and um, the invariant distribution, of course, is going to be unique. Now, what one can prove, okay, is the following. That if we look at the invariant distribution, the long-run prospects, okay, uh, the long-run prospects are that any two individuals are going to be non-negatively non -negatively correlated, okay? And in fact, they will be positively correlated if they're in the same component, okay? And um, um, uh, that's not very hard to prove, and I'm not going to talk about why it's true here, but the theorists among you, I expect a proof by the end of the lecture, okay? Uh, and... Um, um, uh, and so, despite the fact that we have, at least in some circumstances, negative correlation in the short run, we get positive correlation in the long run. Um, um, now, there are some easy circumstances where we can solve this model out. Okay? So, for example, um, 
Uh, let's suppose that our social network is, is that, that we have only two individuals and they're connected to each other. So our social network is a dyad. Okay. Um, uh, we can solve for the invariant distribution. Um, and um, uh, I have Mathematica on my laptop, so I did that. Um, and, and, uh, you know, you're, you're, and because of the fact that these guys are connected, it's not, you know, the usual Bernoulli distribution. The odds ratio, you know, the odds of, um, so, so the, the thing to notice with the dyad is that there's a lot of symmetry in the situation, right? That, that um, uh, essentially all we need to do in order to understand the, pro that if we just count the number of people who are employed, that's Markov, right? So we can actually reduce the dyad, uh, which has four states, right, zero, one for me, zero, one for you, down to three states, the number of people employed, zero, one, or two. And that's a Markov process. And I've written out what the transition probabilities are, zero, one, and two today, zero, one, and two tomorrow. And the invariant distribution, you can see, is a little bit biased away from independence towards having more people employed. Okay, maybe for comparison, I should go to the next slide, which is, I should have started with this, of course, if you have no link at all. If you've got two independent people, right, what do you get for your invariant distribution? Your invariant, the, the delta, of course, is just the normalizing factor, right, that turns everything into a probability. And you'll notice two zeros, Q squared. Two uh, ones, P squared. Two PQ is the probability of the joint, right? So this is, this is essentially, you know, the independent situation, right? I have a job with probability P, I gain a job with probability P, I lose a job with probability Q, right? So this is what happens if, there, if, if, if uh, there's no connection. When we connect them, okay, we get a new distribution, we get a different invariant distribution, and it stochastically dominates, right, the, the invariant distribution in the no-link case. Why is that? Now, because if I'm employed and I get a uh, job offer, it's not wasted, right? I get to tell you about it, okay? And so that increases the likelihood in the long run that you're going to be employed, and similarly for me in the long run, and so that's the source of our stochastic domination. So this seems like good news, right? It seems like when you have more links, right, that you're going to get more employment. Um, it's fun, actually, to play around with these. I spend a lot of time playing around with these. I, I solved out this one, which we won't talk about. Um, when you have a pair of cliques, um, um, I, I, I guess the th thing to say about a clique is that if you've got a clique, then again, it suffices just to count the number of people employed, right? Um, if you've got a pair of cliques, then you want to count the number of people employed in clique one, the number of people employed in clique two. That will be Markov, and you get a product distribution. Um, and then uh, the minute you get to this, um, I turned off Mathematica after five hours, right? Actually, it was, it was actually, I think, when, the, when, when my disk filled up, the, you know, the, the swap file took all the memory or something like that. And um, um, so this model is very hard to do anything with, and, uh, and as simple as it is, and in their slightly more complicated version of this, Jackson and, and, and Armengol resort to a lot of numerical uh, simulation. So the one thing I want to leave you with to just show you how counterintuitive can be, things can be, it looks from studying the dyadic case that when you add more links, um, uh, you can, uh, um, that when you add more links, you, you will get higher stochastic, you know, you'll get more employment, right? If we count the number of employed people, it's kind of going up in the sense of first order stochastic dominance. That's not necessarily true. Okay, um, and I worked out an example, and it, I don't, I've only got about 10 minutes left, and I don't want to take the time to, I, I will show you this example, but you can do the following, you can actually work this out on your own, okay, um, and that is the, the, the following, suppose you just have, I like green, okay, compare a line of five, okay, with a line of Oops, we need one more for five. Two and then three, okay? And if you compute the invariant distribution for the line of five versus the clique of two and the clique of three, you will see that you get more employment down here, all right? And the reason is that there are some configurations of the model where um, um, that can only... Um, 
let me see if, if, if it's worth explaining this. Um, in this model up here, it's pretty easy to evolve into situations that look like this. Um, And if you evolve to a situation like this, when this guy gets an offer, it's wasted. Okay? Now, down here you can also reach this kind of state as well. Okay? But it turns out that you're more likely to reach a 0, 0, 1, 1, 1 when you've got everything fully connected than when, um, than when you don't. Okay? And I started out, when I was writing these lecture notes, actually... Sh I thought that the reason, there's a way in which, in which the Armand Gold Jackson model is spuriously hard. And so I went to this kind of birth death kind of model because they're easier to study. Um, and I was sure that I could actually prove a result that said that when you had more links, you would get more, um, more employment. Okay? And so I started working on this, and I have a whole set of tools that are good for this kind of thing. And I deployed them, and they didn't work, and they didn't work. And so finally I said, um, why don't I simulate this thing? Okay? So I simulated this thing, and of course I got exactly the opposite answer. Um, and then I simulated again with slightly different numbers. I still got the wrong answer. And after I simulated enough, I said, well, why don't I think about this analytically? And once I thought about it analytically, I realized why this had to be true. Right? And namely is that you can, you can get, this is a bad state to get to. Um, and it's more easier to get to it here than it is to get to it here. Um, and, and, I could draw some pictures and explain why, but I don't want to take the time. But what I want you to come away with right, is the idea is simply that, that more connections are not always good. Okay? Because what happens here is that more, more connections create a cluster within which right, job referrals are wasted. Okay? Um, and, um, uh, and it's worthwhile. Um, so it's worthwhile understanding, I suppose, for what kind of networks this would not be true for. Um, and um, um, and um, um, and it's certainly the case that that you know more social structure is clearly not better. Yes. Well, remember that it, you, the minute you do that, you're changing both sides of the calculation, right? So, so um, you know, I chose one almost at random in some sense, and I've got this counterintuitive result. Um, I think it makes it, so I'm not saying, I, it, it's certainly going to be the case. It certainly is the case that I can write down graphs for which when I add one link, things get better. So, well, certainly the dyad actually shows that, right? So... What I know is, is that sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I could probably jiggle this model a little bit, and I'd still come up, I think, with sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, uh, and, 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 and so what I want you to understand, this is kind of a negative result that simply says that, um, and this, I think, is a very important point in doing graph theoretic analysis, um, that, um, uh, that, um, um, that the fine details of the model matter. Okay, and that's very discouraging, I think, because you know we, we when we do theory, right? Um, we don't want to commit to the fine details of our model the same way that when you're doing some kind of structural estimation, you're using parametric forms, you know, functional. When you're using you know functional forms and getting identification off of them, you don't want to think that your analysis like really deeply depends on that. You'd like to believe it doesn't. Right? Um, and it's not what you do, but you have this wish that you express in every seminar, right? And it's the same thing in theory, right? And what I'm suggesting here is that, that wish is not likely to be granted, right? Um, that there's, there's, there's not a, like a large general theory. If there were, I would be presenting a very well developed literature instead of little bits and pieces. Um, I want to move on and see if I can talk about one more thing um, in the time that I have. Um, all right, so Stephen and I wrote a paper. I'm not going to talk about our paper, OK? <laughs> Pardon? Read it. Read it. It's there. It's on the reading list. OK. Uh, let me, let me uh, um, right. Um, 
I will say the one thing about our paper, which I think is interesting, um, is that um, we at one question that we asked in this paper was uh, we, we actually, a, a model that is estimated very often is a linear, so-called linear social interactions model, a model where you say something like, um, the action that I take today depends upon my characteristics and the characteristics of other people and the average action or the, you know, in a, or the actions of other people in some linear way. Right? And one way of doing that is by averaging everybody in a group, or there are other ways of doing it as well. Um, it is often alleged that that model is uh, unidentified. It's not identified. We show that if you think about a rich class of linear models like that, the set for which it's not identified is small. But what's more important is the following thing. We asked the following question. We, saw, we thought about the following. Um, I say following a lot because it's my um, okay, um, okay. Uh, it would be very discouraging if the only way to estimate, if you could only estimate social interaction models, linear social interaction models or any other kind of social interaction models, knowing exactly what the social relationships are like, okay? Because frankly, how often are you going to know that, right? So um, if we're locked into knowing the social network, there's a lot of things we can't study. So we built, Stephen and I and two co-authors, built a game theoretic model of social interactions on a network where it was a Bayesian game where we all have some type that describes our personal characteristics and um, we all choose an action um, and, um, uh, and uh, uh, we use Bayes-Nash equilibrium and you've all studied Bayes-Nash equilibrium in first year micro theory so I don't have to I'm going to leave you to imagine what that setup might be, okay? One way of understanding it, by the way, is just to think, because here's a problem that you solved. Random Corneau, or, 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 or you know, incomplete information Corneau, when you don't know the marginal cost of the other guy. It's essentially that model in the quadratic case, okay? Except with more people and, and, and a little bit of other things, but not too much, right? And, um, uh, and it turns out that this has an equilibrium, and what we want to know is we want to know what the utility parameters are. That's what we want to estimate. And the question that we ask ourselves is, can we estimate that without knowing the social network? Okay. And what we discovered is that, is that the utility parameters in some circumstances, and they're all detailed in the paper, is that the utility parameters are identified under some circumstances, even without knowing the social network. And that is a very interesting fact because it creates the pos It suggests two things. Number one, it suggests the possibility of being able to estimate these things even when you don't know the social network. Okay, the utility parameters. Um, the next question is, well, why do you want to know the utility parameters? You want to know the utility parameters so that you can perform policy experiments and see what's going to happen, right? Um, well, if you don't know the social network, you can't actually pin down, right, what the answer is going to be, right, the policy answer is going to be, because you don't know exactly how things are going to diffuse, but certainly you can get welfare bounds. Now, we didn't derive any of the welfare bounds in that paper, but I think it's doable. I think it's actually even not hard. Um, and so that suggests that we can actually go some way forward in studying social interactions, even with micro data, without knowing the social network. That seems to me to be a good thing, okay? So I think it's a great paper, okay. Um, all right, so let's, how did we get to social capital? Okay. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit about, I don't want to talk about social capital. Okay. Um, let's, I'm going to just do one more model and then I'll stop, okay? I want to talk a little bit about, about, about social learning, right? So we spent some time talking. Mm -hmm. It's sort of contrast the identification issues in the linear model with the standard Campbell Bayes equation issues in these models here. I mean, there are some additional conditions, but uh, I don't know if you plan to talk about it. I thought that was fascinating. I mean, it is like a Campbell Bayes. Right. Model. So it is. It is. All these issues about reflection, right. and imaginary, and all of the standard, a lot of the standard tricks of Campbell Bayes equations right. Right, apply in this setting, right? right? Yes. But So let me say something, and then you can add something, well, right? Well, you have oral models talking about this, too, right? Do you want to, do you want to, what do you want to do? <laughs> but you also have another hour or two, right? 
you know, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I, I am, I am, I am free here. I'm happy to stay here until 9.04. Is that right? 9.05. Okay. 9.05. I'm happy to stay here until 9.05. All right. So let me, uh, right. Were you, you, you weren't going to talk. So let me say one. Th- all right. So, all right. So let me say just a little. So first off, um, uh, uh, there are a lot of things that we prove, right, in the paper, a number of things that we prove. When, when I think, about, when I think about, about the classic simultaneous equation stuff, I think about rank and order conditions. And so one question to ask is, how did, how did rank and order conditions and that kind of thinking help us in thinking about these problems? And the answer is twofold. For 99% of the theorems, they did not help at all. They're just completely off the table. For the best theorem in the paper, it was exactly the rank and order conditions. It's that theorem, the one that, you know, the, the last theorem we added, right? So, um, and I'll tell you what that theorem says. Um, this theorem says that if we actually have, I have to explain one more thing about the model. There are two ways in which individual char- my characteristics can have an influence on you, all right? Um, and this is true in general of social interaction models. and and um, all right, maybe I should go back and actually point to a slide to say this. Um, uh, there are, are okay. Um, all right, I, I, I don't. So I, I'll just say it. Okay. There are two ways. Oh, I, maybe we can actually see it. Okay. Um, there are. There are. Unfortunately, I have the things on two different slides. So let me just say what it is. There are two ways in which my characteristics. Um, might affect you, all right? Um, so I suppose that, 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 uh, um, uh, that I, I'm a kid in an elementary school and I come from a wealthy family, okay? So on the one hand, my, wealth, my wealthy family is investing in like tutoring time or something like that for me. And so that lifts my performance up. And through the peer effect, that lifts your performance up too. So that's the social interaction effect that we're looking for, right? But there's another way. It might also be that my family is buying public goods for the school, right? My, 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 my kids actually went to school in Israel for a year, and um, we had to chip in to buy an air conditioner, okay? Contribute to the public good, all right? The wealthy, you know, uh, 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 we made the mistake of sending our kids to a school in a wealthy neighborhood, so everybody had to pitch in, right? Uh, and... Uh, um, and uh, so, um, uh, uh, so there are these two ways that, that my characteristics can work. One is the peer effect, and the other one is what Chuck Mansky calls a contextual effect. Okay? And the best examples I can think of, and Stephen has many other examples, the ones that come most naturally to my mind are thinking of things in a community like the provision of local public goods. Okay? Um, uh, and, and, and the best example I think of is to think about the things that you can contribute to a classroom directly because, um, uh, uh, you know, because of your wealth or something like that. Um, uh, and um, uh, so um, um, I guess another example, this actually might be something a little bit different, but let me try it, is that suppose that I am a, a, a kid with, with high cognitive abilities. That means, um, in part, that my performance might inspire you and might lift you up. We have our peer effect. It also might be the case that um, because uh, I'm a good student, uh, the teacher doesn't have to spend a lot of time with me and can spend more time with everybody else. Right? That's a kind of contextual effect, is it not? So there's another example of a contextual effect. So we imagine in our paper, we imagine that there are two distinct networks at work. One network delivers contextual effects. Another network delivers peer effects. We assume that the contextual effects network is known because there are lots of cases where that's a plausible assumption. We want to see how far we can get with assuming that the peer effects network are un- is unknown. And we have one of these weighted matrices, right? These weighted adjacency matrix, which describes the peer effect network. So now we have the problem. How many, let's think for a moment now about what we have to uh, identify. We have to identify coefficients, what we would like to be able to identify in the best of all possible worlds. Let me start again. There's only three things in this model I care about. I care about the parameters of the utility function. Right? I don't really want to identify, I guess I don't, I, I'm not particularly interested in identifying the peer effects network matrix, the matrix that describes it. Okay? 
But, let's, but those are things that are in the linear equation system that we're studying. So I might write down that whole linear equation system and say, well, I know some of these things. I don't know others of these things. When can I know these other things, okay? Including the stuff that I don't care about, namely the elements of the matrix A. And it turns out that classical rank and order conditions give you, the exam give you answers to that question. Or at least things that are, well, A, it was inspired by it, and B, it's a very close analog. So essentially, um, the classical conditions are actually very helpful to some degree. And what we learned from that is the following. We learned that, well, they're not a choice variable. I mean, it's a, it's, yeah. Well, you end up with the simultaneous equation system and, and, right. And now, right. Well, let me, let me, so let me tell you, let me tell you what the rank and order, let me tell you what the rank and order conditions say. And when I say, when I say what they say, you will not be surprised, I think. And that is, they say, let's imagine the network that we would, we would construct just by merging the two networks together. Okay. Now, suppose that that network is not terribly dense. So that I've got some social relationships of some kind, some peer, some contextual, some maybe both, but I don't have too many, okay? So let's suppose that everybody is connected to everybody else, but that connection, but there are not too many connections. If that's the case, then, the, then, then that's just saying that there's a lot of exclusion restrictions all over the place, a lot of zeros, okay? And that means that now you're, in the class, you're back in the classical game. Right, so that's, that's the result that we learn from the rank and order conditions. But everything else that we learn comes from the fact that this is, um, at the end of the day, the utility, the, uh, utility parameters are working in a nonlinear way. And so we're looking at, at kind of cross-equation at, at cross constraints, okay, on parameters. Right, but the cross-equation the cross, the cross restrictions are nonlinear. Because, because the way the utility parameters enter the, the yeah, so, so um, yeah. But, but you know, at, at the end of the day, it's all about when is a map one to one, when is it not? And there's only so many different ways of doing that, right? So I think of all of these things as being related. Um, but it is really, I was, I, I, I was sure for a long time that, uh, that the classical rank and order conditions said nothing, and I was very surprised when one of my co-authors hit me over the head with this very cool result. And it's very interesting to think that as long as the network is not too connected, you can learn a lot. Right. And we have some other results, by the way. Right. Well, I, I, but I, I think that point is right, isn't it? That, that, that if all you were to do were to write down, say, the Linda Datcher kind of model or something like that, right. yeah, you're, that, that it's, all, it's all rank and order conditions. Right. That's, that's all I'm saying. Right. No, I understand right. And that, is, and that is a take-home point. Maybe that's the only take-home point of that, that if you actually have an equilibrium, if you have an economic model, you have more paths into thinking about identification because the model imposes, imposes additional constraints. Right? And if you believe the model, right, then, then, uh, um, then this gives you extra lever. And, in that, and, and, and for most of what we do, that's where we get our leverage. So all of our aggregation results, for example, come this way. So, so, um, so uh, yeah, so um, I, that's a really, if I could tell like my first year students at Cornell one thing, that's what I would say, that, that economic models lever a lot of stuff. <laughs> and, and you're laughing because you, you, you think it's obvious, but when I read the journals, I think it's so not obvious to so many people. <laughs> so I'm gonna trip over the stair if I don't. Let me talk about one more thing. <laughs> um, Stephen, well, I'm trying to find where I'm in the notes. You want to add something?
There was a sense in which the ad health questionnaire asked the wrong question. Instead of asking who your friends were, they should have said, who don't you know? Right? Then you'd have had exclusion restrictions. That would help. Right? <laughs> so um, uh, let me talk about, about, about one model very, very briefly. I know I'm, I'm standing between you and the bus, but the, well, the bus isn't coming till 6. Um, so this is, uh, um, I, I want to talk a little bit about social learning. Uh, I, I, you know, we, we, we've talked a bit about jobs diffusing on a network, but we actually haven't provided any models of diffusion at all. Turns out that diffusion of actions has been studied on networks. Diffusion of rumors have been studied on networks. Um, and um, uh, you know what? Maybe instead of studying this, what I want to talk about is the diffusion of actions. Okay, I think that's easier to do, and I want to talk about some diffusion in an economic context. So here's a, a model that I want you to think about. Um, so here's a simple coordination game. Let's suppose that A and B are positive, and there are these two behaviors, cap A, cap B, and if we all agree to do cap A, we get some payoff, and if we all agree to do cap B, we get some other payoff. So this is an example of a coordination game. It has three equilibria. It has the, the upper right, lower left, and it also has a mixed equilibria. Okay? Equilibrium. All right. Um, so we all have done that to death since we were undergrads. Um, now we might ask, what happens in this model if we were to um, just start with some arbitrary distribution of play and assume that everybody was interacting with everybody else. We could tell some random matching story or something like that. What would that dynamic look like? And the answer is, is that if we start with enough people playing um, B, uh, we're going to head off to B. If we start with enough people playing A, we're going to head off to A. Okay? So the dynamic that I have in mind is that I have, so let me be precise about this, I have at random moments of time an opportunity to choose a, um, uh, whether I want to play A or B. And I'll have an opportunity to switch again, but I'm very myopic about this. And, and, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to think, well, who am I going to be partnered up with next? And I know the fraction of A and B in the population. And so I can do a simple expected utility calculation and decide whether in the short run it's better for me to play A or it's better for me to play B. Okay? And, um, um, and, that, and, and it turns out there will be a threshold. If the fraction of A in the population is high enough, every, I should play A. If not, I should play B. Okay? Um, and, and, and one can do a lot of variations on this. One can, can, can in particular, one can add uh, people can be thinking about the future and so on and so forth. Um, but this is good enough for us. Um, so uh, what is, 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 is the case in this um, situation um, is the following. You'll notice here that we have a large region where we're going to head off to B. Okay? 
Uh, the way I've drawn this is not in the center, purposefully not in the center, right? So a lot of region A, we're going to head off to B, small part of the reason, re domain where we're going to head off to A, OK? Now, um, if I go to a more general coordination game where A and B, A, A and B, B are going to be the equilibrium, but we have these different payoffs from mismatching, OK? So if we mismatch, we're going to have some losses, and these are the so the way I've set this up where A is bigger than C and B is bigger than D, clearly you want to coordinate. And if you fail to coordinate on when your opponent is playing A, you're going to get C. If you fail to coordinate with your opponent when he's playing B, you're going to get D. Okay. Now I can rig these things in such a way that, um, that A is a higher number than B. And yet, nonetheless, that threshold that I drew favors moving off to B. Okay, and the reason is is that even though even though it's good if we it's better if we could all agree to coordinate on A, if we fail to coordinate on A, we get really really screwed, right? But um, you know if I if I try for A and you're not doing A, I'm just really hammered, right? But on the other hand, if I try for B and you don't do B, it's not so bad, okay? So you can imagine how that could push the threshold around. Now. Um, uh, and, and, and so in that situation, we say that A is Pareto dominant, or payoff dominant is another term, and we say that B is risk dominant. Um, um, and uh, in studying dynamics, learning dynamics, or evolutionary dynamics in games, there's a tension between payoff and risk dominance um, in that um, lots of dynamical processes that we write down favor risk dominant selection, which is to say we tend to move towards the risk dominant equilibrium. Um, and uh, we tend to move away, and even, even when the risk dominant equilibrium is not Pareto or payoff dominant. Okay. Um, all right. Um, yeah. Um, all right. So risk dominance gets very complicated to extend when we talk about, say, three, three strategy games. All right, or you know anything other than two by two, um, I can make sense of all of these concepts, but I, I I don't get to use the 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 cheap tools of risk and payoff dominance. So let me not. Okay. All right. Um, so um, so here's a, a a dynamic that has been studied a lot, and that is that at random moments in time, right? It's it's exactly what I just described. At random moments of time, a little alarm clock goes off. I think of it as a Poisson alarm clock because it's like an old clock I used to have when I was a graduate student. The waiting time between rings was exponentially distributed, um, and 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 independently too. I might add uh, that was the key. It was independent, um, and so uh, um, uh, and and whenever that alarm clock goes off, you you look around and you say, should I change the strategies that I'm 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 playing? And again, what you're interested in is immediate return. And you look and you see, well, what fraction of the people are playing A? What fraction of the people are playing B? And you kind of go with what's best, OK? However, small chance you screw up, right? This is the Parkinson's theory of game, right? You're trembling, OK? And you might make a mistake and play B when you mean to play A and vice versa. And so, um, um, uh, and so we have this little error probability in there, OK? Um, and there are different ways of modeling that. OK, that's fine. So what happens now when we, we, when we add this little bit of stochastic perturbation, which is to say that sometimes people make errors. Or you could tell other stories about, about idiosyncratic payoffs or something like that. OK, um, uh, the answer is now that our best response dynamic now becomes a Markov process. OK, and that Markov process has an invariant distribution. Right? What does that invariant distribution look like? Right? Well, the way that I've drawn this picture, so first off, I've assumed that B is payoff dominant. And you'll notice I've, I've, I've made A, this, these are actual plots. Um, uh, uh, there's some small epsilon. I don't remember what the numbers are. You'll notice that the, forget these things for a moment, you'll notice that the distribution is flat and it piles up at B. And the higher is N, the more it piles up at B. It doesn't pile up quite at B all the way over here at the end because there is the small probability of a tremble, right? So, um, but it tends to pile up. Now, what does it look like in between? Well, there's a little hump here that's so tiny you can't see, okay? And then it turns out that there's a, like a little dip here. All of this stuff is so tiny you can't see it on this scale, okay? But really what it looks like is a little hump all the way over, big hump, okay? 
and the little hump is getting littler, and the valley is getting littler, and the big hump is getting bigger as we shrink epsilon. Um, uh, that's what's happening. Okay, um, and uh, um, and so there's a there's a um, a name for this. What happens? Uh, we say that uh, the strategy B is stochastically stable, in that if we look at the invariant distribution as we make this error probability smaller and smaller and smaller, this error the invariant distribution is piling up at B. Okay, so um, this is a theory that's been developed by a number of people. Okay. Um, all right. Um, now, what you might ask is, is, what happens when you try and do that on graphs? Okay, and um, uh, and it turns out that what happens on a graph actually depends upon the shape of the graph. Okay, so if we now imagine that people are playing this coordination game, but they're only kind of interacting with their neighbors, right? So this guy wakes up and he says, "Well, what's this guy doing?" Right? This guy wakes up and he says, "What's this guy doing?" This guy here wakes up and he says, well, I have four neighbors. What are they doing on average? And now we can look at the dynamics of that. Okay? And it turns out that in this case, in this graph, right, the, uh, um, the uh, payoff dominance, uh, risk dominance, the, you, this risk dominance selection that I just described, this risk dominant um, emergence doesn't happen. And, 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 well, actually, whether or not it happens depends upon the nature of how you model the mistakes. But for the mistake model that I described, where there's just some probability that's small that you just you know, make a mistake, um, uh, you, know, you flip a coin, and if it lands on edge, you play the wrong thing. Um, uh, in that model, uh, it turns out that the A and the B can emerge with equal likelihood, even though uh, B is risk dominant. Okay? Um, and that's kind of a, a surprising thing. Okay? Um, and so um, this, this, this um, observation led a number of people, uh, including Steve Morris and including myself, to think about how coordination might evolve in some kind of graph. So let me show you very quickly. Um, I'm going to stop in five minutes, no matter where I am. Let's suppose that that threshold that I talked about, the threshold that's necessary um, to get me to play B is less than one half. And now let me assume that there's no error probability at all. Right? So I'm just going to, you know, the players are going to best respond. Right? So we'll suppose that the red players are playing B and the black players are playing A. Okay? Now, what happens when a red player's alarm clock goes off? The red player looks up. He says, wow, I've got one red neighbor, one black neighbor, one A, one B. If it's 50-50, I'm better off playing B, so I'm going to stay. Similarly for the other red player. What about a black player? Well, if this black player over here wakes up, he says, gee, I'm surrounded by black players playing A. I want to play A too. Nothing happens, right? What about this guy right here, right? Well, when he wakes up, he says, well, I've got a black on one side, a red on the other. It's 50-50. I want to switch from black to red, right? Because the threshold is below 50, and so he does so. And now we've just expanded. Well, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to see what's going to happen, so you're not going to do much more of that. What happens here when we do this on a lattice, OK? Um, when we do this on a lattice, if we start out with two, okay, uh, well, the first thing to say is suppose that the threshold were between one half and one quarter, okay, bigger, bigger than one quarter but less than one half. If this guy wakes up, he says, well, I have three neighbors that are choosing black. That's not enough to keep me doing red, so I'm going to switch, okay? Um, uh, and, and, and so you can imagine what ha if, if this guy wakes up, he's got. Again, he, everyone here has three neighbors doing black, so these guys are going to get wiped out. Okay? Um, uh, if P, let's talk about what happens when P is less than one quarter. When P is less than one quarter, these guys are going to stay. Okay? When they, well, yeah, I want to make sure. One, two, three, yeah. Uh, when P is less than one quarter, these guys are going to stay. When this guy's alarm goes off, he's got one quarter of his neighbors playing red. He's going to switch. And then the guy next to him, and that's all going to continue to expand. Now, um, one can actually write down graphs where one gets stable regions where you get stuck. When we move away from lattices and we move to asymmetric situations like this, um, uh, it becomes um, kind of more complicated to figure out what's going on. And there's a very um, interesting history 
about this literature that I think I'm just going to tell you very quickly that, that I wrote a paper kind of talking about this problem on lattices and kind of worked it all out on lattices. Um, and, um, and then uh, an interesting question to ask is what happens on general networks? And I didn't know what to do. And then Steve Morris came along and he wrote a paper doing this on general networks. He figured out this really complicated thing and the paper goes on for pages and pages and pages, right? And then John Kleinberg comes along and John Kleinberg is a computer scientist um, and a very brilliant guy. Um, and um, uh, and uh, he wrote up a proof of what happens, the Morris thing that's half a page. And it's very, not only that, but it's very, very clear, right? And, uh, um, and I have to say that, uh, you know, I was just wowed when I saw that. I, th I, I thought this was so hard, it really, it really didn't make sense to try and do it. Steve Morris was convinced by the time he finished it that it was a waste of time because it was so much effort, right? And then um, Kleinberg has this very simple idea. All right, so, um, the key idea in understanding whether things are going to diffuse on a network or not, right, is to ask the question, um, what are your neighbors doing? And we've been asking this question. Well, a critical question to ask is, you know, what does your neighbor's set look like? So um, uh, let's look at this set A, B, and C, these things, all right? Um, every one of these guys has two-thirds of their neighbors, at least two-thirds of their neighbors in the set A, B, and C, okay? And only one third of their neighbors out. And of course, here's a guy who has none of his neighbors out. Okay? So we say that this, is a dense, uh, this cluster has density two thirds because everybody has at least two thirds of their neighbors in this set. Right? All right, so suppose that the probability P star to get you to leave B was less than one third. And suppose that these guys were all doing, right, um, uh, doing B, right? They were all red. Well, each one of them has at least two-thirds of their neighbors in the set, so they're going to stay, okay? And uh, uh, actually, actually, yeah, so even if, even if the probability there is two-thirds, they're still going to stay, and so this set is going to be stable if that threshold for switching from B to A is no higher than two-thirds, okay? Um, and, uh, um, and so um, this is kind of a key to understanding what goes on in general. Um, uh, you'll notice in this process that once someone switches, there's never going to be incentive for them to switch back because um, uh, the process can only move forward. Uh, uh, if, you were doing, if you were doing A before and uh, uh, suppose you're surrounded by all, by, by all A's, right? You're still going to be surrounded by all A's. Finally, some reds get to you, right? If some reds get to you, right, that might make you switch to reds, all right? But what is the force that's going to bring you back? Well, the only thing that's going to bring you back is if someone else who was playing reds is going to switch, switch, right? But you can't unwind any, I mean, I think it's clear that you can't unwind any of this. If you had random switching, maybe you could, but without random switching, once you're done, you're done. It can only get better for you because the only thing that can happen is that more neighbors of you join up with you and do what you're doing, okay? Um, so, um, um, the, so if we were to ask, for example, when, when, when can we have a, what can stop a cascade? And I'm not going to go through the proof here. I'll just tell you what the answer is. The only thing that could stop a cascade is having a cluster of people who are really all tied into each other, all doing the other thing. So imagine that, that we have a cluster probability. Suppose that the threshold for switching from A to B, I'm sorry, from B to A, B is our risk dominant thing. Suppose the the, prob the threshold probability is between one third and one half, okay? And now we're kind of rolling along and people are switching from, uh, from, B to, from A to B, A to B, A to B. And finally we hit that cluster that we saw in the last picture, okay? And this cluster is all doing A, right? Well, they need to have neighbor, they need to have at least two thirds neighbors, they need to have at least two thirds of their neighbors doing A in order to continue to play A, correct? Okay, but the fact is they do, so they're not going to switch. If, our, if we're kind of running along like this, and we get to here and people are switching to B, what's this guy going to do? He's not going to change, so this blocks the cascade. Okay, so what stops cascades are clusters. Every graph has, a, cas has a, a kind of a cluster threshold. You can look at all of the different clusters in the, gr in the graph. You can compute for each one of them a threshold, okay? Um, you can, well, you can compute, uh, uh, the, I'm sorry, you can compute the density of the cluster. 
And the density of the cluster, you can then look at the, at the, at the maximum density of all of the clusters in the graph. Okay? If the threshold probability is such that you need to have more than that maximal density in order to stay with A, then your cascade is going to go through. If not, the, that, those islands of A are always going to remain. Furthermore, if those islands of A are, on a, are, are a block in some sense, right? if they are you know, something that kind of stops you from going forward, the entire cascade will stop there. Right? So essentially what the, um, 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 and, and the way that we would understand, I guess so what I want to say is, is, that, is that we can also look at larger clusters, like if we're moving from left to right, or yeah, from uh, right to left, we can look at everything over here, and that's a very large cluster, right? Um, and we would see that this cluster rule actually works for the, for the, entire, for the entire graph. You look at, the, at, at, at all the different possible subsets of the vertices. You compute the cluster density for all of them. The maximal density gives you a threshold. Okay? And a cascade, there will be a cascade if the, if the um, probability, the threshold probability is, is above the threshold. Otherwise, it won't. Okay? Um, and that's kind of a complete analysis, and it's for very general graphs. right? So um, we can essentially compute everything. Um, What's disappointing about this is that um, there's no possibility of switching back. The error story that I told earlier was a very nice story. What happens when there's a probability of, uh, of, of actually going backward? Can a cluster, can, a, can, can this ever unwind? Okay. And the answer to that question, um, except for special cases, is largely not, not, not known. Right? What, what, what certainly is true is that errors alone could make the whole thing unwind. Okay? Um, but um, um, is it the case that we're always going to then get back to where we, you know, are, are we going to keep going back and forth? Um, does the stochastic stability calculation that I suggested earlier tell you anything about whether you can have a cascade on threshold? And the answer to that is unknown. Um, um, Peyton Young has a conjecture that says that most of the time, um, uh, uh, what you see as being uh, stochastically stable when you have everybody randomly mixing with each other should be as well on a network. Um, but we do, as I said, have known counterexamples to that. And so, so that's a, a, a question which is open for research. The last thing I want to say about this is, well, what difference then does the network structure make? Why do we care about networks if, if it seems that the answer is very often the same? Um, and the answer to that question is, is, is that uh, where networks have an effect is, 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 is the speed with which transitions take place. If we're going to do this random matching thing, it can take a very, very long time. For an, and Basically, what has to happen is that if we all start at, 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 say, A, or stay at B, that is my phone. That's really embarrassing. Um, if we start at, well, we'll just let it ring. This is the moment where the speaker is supposed to step on the phone. OK. Um, if we start at, at um, um, at, at, at B and, um, and ask how long it's going to take in order to get to A, we need to have a lot of mistakes pile up to get enough people going to A that it's going to make it worthwhile for people to switch over to A. Okay? But on the other hand, how many mistakes do I need to have um, in order to get this kind of thing going on, um, uh, say, on a line? The answer is, once I get two people, it's stable, right? And then it kind of just takes off from there. So I only have to wait for a couple of people. I only have to wait for two mistakes on the line to get from all B to all A, OK? Whereas I have to wait for 50, more than 50% of the line to change for, from B to A. I'm really sorry. Uh, <laughs> you know, just things ring in my pocket. I don't know what it is. Uh, <laughs> Just for the tape, I want it to be known that it wasn't my phone the last time. It was this microphone that was ringing. Uh, so um, um, anyways, um, have anyone ever just like stepped on a phone? There. OK. Now, <laughs> that's pretty dramatic. Um, so uh, I, I really want to stop, and I'm trying to talk very fast in order to stop, and I'm confusing myself. So um, uh, the point I want to make is that, is that, is that networks have this, have this um, rather dramatic property is that they really speed up these transitions. And so what we might expect to see in looking at dynamics of things like, um, um, say, adoptions of new technologies 
and things like this, is that we might expect to see things piling up and not happening very much at all, and then getting these kind of very fast dynamics. And then we get to our new state, and we stay there for a long time, and then we get very fast dynamics somewhere else. Um, and the, and the, when, when the new thing is introduced, the transition times will be much, much faster. So the long-run dynamics may well be independent to a large degree, although not entirely, to a large degree they may be independent of the network structure, but the transients of the processes will be very different. Okay? Um, and of course, as economists, we all live in the short run. right? Uh, this, is, this, is, this is what I learned from Keynes. Um, uh, and where did I learn that? Wasn't the tract on monetary reform that he said that? I think. Um, so um, uh, in any event, um, uh, I'll stop here. Um, there's a lot of other stuff I did want to talk about that I would like to talk about with you. I will be here all day tomorrow. Unfortunately, I have to fly off Thursday morning. Uh, I'm happy to talk with you at dinner and, um, and until we go to dinner. Thank you very much. <laughs>